Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the 24th lecture of uh, surface engineering. We already have started discussing the specific techniques for uh, various approaches of surface engineering of uh, engineering solids and uh, we began discussing uh, uh, the techniques which are concerned with uh, applying a controlled amount of surface deformation onto the surface. Uh, principally with the aim to create residual compressive stress uh, to improve the fatigue resistance or uh, certain other kinds of uh, resistance against uh, surface uh, failures. Uh, the principal mechanism of uh, that approach was uh, to create uh, strain, plastic strain and uh, increase dislocation density onto the surface uh, so that eventually we create residual compressive stress. Uh, today we are going to discuss uh, surface hardening which is a thermally activated process with the same aim that we want to harden the surface uh, and uh, we are essentially when we talk of surface hardening uh, in particular we are talking about uh, all the discussions are concerned with steel uh, the interstitial solid solution of carbon in alpha iron. So, in steel uh, we all are aware um, if you look into the first view graph, um, if you, if you uh, just uh, consider the, uh, the solid state part of the iron carbon diagram. So, this is the so called uh, eutectoid portion. Um, so, in this uh, surface hardening approach we are concerned with a composition range which is somewhat in this range. So, somewhere around let us say uh, typically about 0.3 to about uh, 0.8 or maybe even less amount of carbon. So, this is the level of uh, carbon content and we are talking about primarily plain carbon steel, but this is certainly applicable to alloy steel as well, but we require typically somewhere around 0.3 I would say optimally 0.4 and above. 0.4 weight percent of carbon or above this is what we need. Um, now, why we need uh, this uh, carbon content I will come, come to that in a minute, but uh, the most important thing that we need to realize is that we essentially in this kind of a treatment if we are talking about a component the cross section of which is let us say of this diameter we would like to harden the surface only up to a certain depth uh, from the surface and not through and through. So, the core will be left in ferritic state the surface because of transient heating is supposed to. Uh, so, essentially the surface should uh, experience a heating cycle which is. Uh, so, this is temperature and this is time. So, we want the surface to reach fairly high temperature and the so called high temperature what we mean should be somewhere around here. So, if this is A C 3 the ferrite to austenite transition uh, line we would expect uh, a temperature typically which should be A C 3 plus about 50 degrees centigrade. So, this is the austenitizing range. So, depending upon the carbon content whether it is 0.6 or 0.4 or 0.3 we just uh, find out what is the corresponding uh, temperature at the AC line and then add up around 50 degree or slightly more to take care of the possible thermal fluctuations during the heating process. So, so the temperature uh, here is somewhere in that range uh, AC 3 plus 50 to 100 degree centigrade and then subsequently we cool. We actually cool by way of some uh, uh, accelerated cooling by way of uh, quenching which could be by application of certain fluids. Uh, we will also discuss that in a minute. So, the whole idea is to uh, use steel whose composition is between this range and then um, subject it to a 
transient heating uh, to a temperature which is in the uh, single phase austenitic zone and then subsequently we quench uh, using some kind of a quenchant to bring it to room temperature and in the process uh, we expect the surface zone up to a certain depth to undergo a phase transition from austenite to martensite. So, the strengthening is because of martensite as compared to the previous surface deformation induced um, uh, uh, processes like shot pinning or shock pinning or laser shock pinning where we introduced uh, plastic strain and dislocation density and that is how we created residual compressive stress. Here the process involves a solid state phase transformation wherein uh, austenite transforms to martensite. So, as I said this is primarily a thermal treatment we want a hard surface and a soft core because the core for example, this ferrite here will actually be able to absorb uh, energy including impact or high strain rate energy whereas, the surface will be able to resist uh, uh, deformation due to wear, abrasion, erosion or any other kinds of surface damages. So, it is important that we actually create a graded microstructure. What we mean is that if this is the cross section we want the uh, uh, gradation such that we have very fine acicular ferrite onto the uh, acicular martensite onto the surface and then in the core we can actually we can afford to have a polyhedral ferritic or ferritoperlytic uh, microstructure. So, in the process we actually see a gradation from pure martensitic to martensite plus perlite and then eventually martensite uh, perlite, uh, perlite ferrite perlite combination. So, this is obtained or achieved through a thermal activation by way of one of the two we are going to discuss uh, so called flame hardening and induction hardening. So, the heating is done either by flame or by uh, electromagnetic induction and in the process the hard surface that we create is called case and uh, typically the case depth could be uh, a millimeter or less even a few millimeters in some cases. So, here is a real time picture. Um, so, this is a very large uh, uh, gear which is subjected to flame from multiple sides and this uh, assembly is rotating at a particular speed. So, that the surface by turn the entire surface by turn is exposed to high temperature and this is the kind of heating cycle the surface actually experiences. So, we heat we actually allow certain residence time, but this is transient heating. So, obviously, this is very short time and then subsequently we quench using some kind of a quenchant. So, um, so first let us pick up the flame hardening where we actually use it could be uh, simply an oxyacetylene or uh, um, uh, some other form of um, uh, flame. Uh, so, we use a burner. So, this is a typical burner with several orifices. So, we actually can. Uh, uh, so, this top portion is uh, primarily to uh, create through the oxygen and acetylene combination and by combustion of this gas mixture we get very high temperature at the tip. The tip typically uh, takes up the ellipsoidal form and, uh, and then subsequently from the sides of the burner uh, nozzle we also have orifices or openings through which we can throw water. So, when this uh, flame is off and the stock or the surface of the stock has reached the required temperature then uh, we want immediate quenching and that is uh, obtained by throwing water or uh, various kinds of uh, coolants um, mixture of water and salt or maybe uh, uh, water and some kind of uh, polymers and so on or oil. Uh, and then that that fluid flow basically extracts heat from the surface and uh, causes a very fast quenching of the surface. So, one thing what we must remember is uh, if you recall I, I kind of just now showed that uh, we are we are only talking about the solid state part of the phase diagram. We are not referring to the the portion which actually is related to the peritactic. So, this is the liquidus line we never cross the liquidus line. So, we are well within the single phase uh, austenitic zone. So, there is no melting. 
The typical hardening temperatures would be about 730 to 7065 degrees centigrade. This essentially depends upon if this is AC3 and depending upon the temperature, depending upon the composition that you are talking about, it can be on the higher side for about 0.3 percent carbon, you actually uh, go to a temperature which is close to 1000 or little over 1000 degrees centigrade. But if the composition is 0 0.6 or close to um, eutectoid temperature, uh, eutectoid point, then you are talking about 727 plus about 50 degree. So, uh, something like uh, 700 and uh, any, anywhere between 730 to 780 or that kind of a temperature range. So, the uh, typically the temperature that we generate onto the surface. Now, this is what we are talking about the temperature of the stocks, but the flame temperature certainly would be little higher because you are uh, uh, actually heating up through radiation um, uh, from the flame. So, the temperature at the surface will be determined by the flame temperature, the size and uh, shape of the flame, the speed at which uh, the workpiece is moving either rotating or translating away from the flame and of course, the material properties which means the conductivity, the density, the specific heat, uh, melting temperatures and so on and so forth. The heating time uh, should be sufficient for thermal and compositional homogenization. Now, we are talking about let us say 0.4 percent carbon steel. So, if we are talking about 0.4 percent carbon at room temperature, we expect a 0.4 percent carbon steel typically a mild steel should have a microstructure which will be both perlite and some amount of ferrite. So, we will have perlitic zone and maybe some ferritic uh, regions left in between. So, typically we expect sort of 50 percent perlite and 50 percent ferrite. This is the kind of microstructural aggregate that we expect from a 0.4 percent carbon steel at room temperature. So, when an aggregate with both ferrite and perlite is subjected to uh, rapid heating to a temperature above the AC3. So, we expect this aggregate to turn into single phase austenite or gamma. That takes time because you have to dissolve A phi 3 C. So, you have alternate sequence of A phi 3 C and alpha and this A phi 3 C has to uh, ha has a composition of 6.67 percent carbon. On the other hand, ferrite uh, composition is somewhere here which is typically uh, let us say 0 0.0258 percent of carbon. So, you have to swing, you have to allow compositional homogenization within a very short distance though. So, typically this is about a micron or a micrometer or a few micrometer apart. So, 6.67, 6.67 and in between 0 0.025. So, within about let us say 2 or 3 micrometer. So, whatever is the heating temperature, you must also allow sufficient time for first of all thermal homogenization which is faster because the thermal conductivity is always higher than the diffusion coefficient, but you also should have sufficient time given. So, that compositionally uh, the whole region when it converts to gamma, this gamma should have a uniform composition of 0.4 percent carbon throughout. So, compositional homogenization is also important. Um, uh, these are the various kinds of uh, 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 the gas mixtures that we use. So, if you use uh, um, a combination of oxygen and air with or oxygen or air with, with uh, acetylene or natural gas or propane. So, this is the kind of flame temperatures that you can develop. So, if it is oxygen, so this is the range of temperatures you can uh, generate or with air uh, the temperature range would be slightly lower. So, one has to control the flow of gases at the tip of the flame, so that uh, uh, the right kind of temperature mix is uh, maintained. So, when you heat, so this is how the flame which is typically uh, assumes the uh, shape uh, um, uh, like this uh, and this uh, is going to heat up the surface. So, let us say this is the, uh, the heated zone and if you now take a section if you take a section like this and on this section, you see the isothermal contours. So, for example, 
these are in Fahrenheit, so approximately uh, the temperatures would be kind of little over half of this. So the temperature at the surface or the meniscus at the surface, this is where you have the maximum heat and the temperature will be the highest. As you go down, uh, you obviously uh, the heat has to flow uh, and that is primarily determined by the conductivity K and uh, this is how the temperature flows into the interior, but the isothermal isotemperature contours meaning this is the line throughout which will be um, maintaining the same temperature or this is the uh, trajectory of the same temperature points. Now, why is it semicircular? It is because heating right below is maximum and similarly heat flows not only in the uh, perpendicular direction or right below, but it also propagates laterally. So, because of uh, heat propagation in all directions uh, in at least in uh, into the vertically downward as well as laterally to x and y directions, the contour surface temperature uh, contour is going to be semicircular like this and as we go uh, to lower and lower uh, higher and higher depth below the surface, the temperature decreases gradually. So, um, if you uh, and this temperature also this is a transient heating. So, with time this isothermal uh, contours change. So, uh, this is what you expect at point 0.1 millisecond region, but after uh, 1 second that means uh, 100 times more than that uh, if, the, if the heating continues for 100 times more than that. So, 0 0.1 millisecond becomes 1 second, then the temperature which earlier was about 1000 Fahrenheit or maybe 550 or so degrees centigrade has now reached easily uh, 1650 and so on. So, this is only limited to a very shallow depth. So, the surface actually should not be exposed to very high temperature, but on the other hand the temperature at the surface should be high enough. So, that up to the desired depth you actually expose the material to the uh, minimum possible temperature or minimum desirable temperature which is which should be above the uh, eutectoid temperature. But of course, there will be a region uh, which is called the heat affected zone. Uh, so, this region so let us say this is the boundary unto which you are able to heat uh, to a temperature above AC 3. So, are you into the single phase gamma region you are able to convert everything into gamma. But there will be also a region below which will be experiencing a temperature which will be um, uh, between the in, in the two phase region of uh, ferrite plus gamma. So, this is single phase gamma and there will be also a region which will actually remain as uh, ferrite plus perlite. So, if this is the composition from the surface a portion below the surface will go into single phase gamma a portion below will be below that will be uh, ferrite plus uh, austenite and then finally, you will also have a, rich uh, uh, a, a certain depth which will be only re remain as ferrite perlite combination. This portion which is gamma pure gamma or the portion which is partly ferrite and partly austenite these two austenitic range regions or these two uh, regions having austenite will directly convert into martensite. So, we are going to see fully martensitic and ferrite plus martensite combination. So, this is typically the uh, uh, configuration uh, for example, for a shaft uh, with a circular section. So, um, so, you are heating it from all sides and the, uh, the heating uh, ring actually can move up or down vertically up or down and as a result you start let us say heating from here and then you go all the way down to. So, you are able to actually heat treat the whole surface. The important point is that heating temperature should not cross the fusion temperature or the so called solidus temperature. So, that some liquid forms we do not want that should happen at all. So, heating should be confined below the solidus temperature and uh, heat flows through thermal conduction and once the uh, temperature has reached the required uh, level, then we also are able to throw water uh, uh, through other orifices and immediately quench the material, quench the surface to room temperature. 
So, the cycle will be room temperature to austenitizing temperature and then subsequently uh, uh, quenching back to room temperature. So, this is the uh, typically the temperature band that we uh, actually um, uh, target. So, this is the eutectoid point and we are talking about uh, typically uh, steel of this composition range. So, this is the level of this is the kind of temperature that we uh, heat up to, but since it is a transient heating very difficult to maintain precise temperature and it is not going to be isothermal condition there will be a gradation of temperature from the surface to the bottom or to the interior. So, as I already said that we expose to high temperature whereby we have single phase austenite and then we quench and in the process we expect the surface to create at the very surface region we expect very high hardness over 60 Rockwell hardness scale Rockwell C hardness scale and uh, the typical case depth the hardened depth can be anything from about 0.7 or 0.5 to uh, as high as uh, 6 millimeters. So, we are talking about more than uh, I mean uh, a substantial amount of uh, depth from the surface. So, typical applications the components which are uh, amenable to such surface hardening by flame would be the, uh, the lathe beds, the centers, the crankshafts, the piston rods, gears and sprockets, teeth of the gear, ax axles, cams, shear blades and so on and so forth. These are all steel products and this whole process is applicable primarily to steel and as I said which should have minimum of 0.3-0.4 percent carbon uh, content. Okay. Now, um, so these are the uh, various geometries which actually can be subjected to a shear blade or uh, uh, a gear teeth or uh, again another uh, gear teeth very cams and various kinds of um, shafts or screws and nuts and so on where the surface always should have higher hardness and higher wear resistance, but the core we would uh, purposely leave as uh, ferritic or ferritoperlitic, so that it can absorb energy and uh, of mechanical deformation and uh, provide toughness. So, the important considerations are the head design, the flame configuration, the nozzle uh, quench nozzle configuration uh, and the velocity with which we throw the, uh, no, uh, the coolant and so on. So, we are we basically can have three types of heads, uh, one is a rectangular head. So, for uh, for uh, materials which are rectangular in nature maybe a blade or a shear blade like that or a cutting uh, tip. So, which are rectangular or square or uh, thin sheets and so on. So, we use a rectangular uh, head for uh, heating. We can use a toroidal head which uh, basically is applicable to cylindrical or circular parts like rolls and races or we can use a contoured head. So, for example, we have a typical uh, we have a very complex shape of a component like this. So, for treating such a uh, uh, such a surface or a component we would like to also have a nozzle which actually will mimic the, uh, the shape of this kind of a, uh, of a component. So, that uh, the distance uh, from the tip of the nozzle to the surface is co is maintained constant. So, uh, these are the design aspects of various uh, uh, nozzles uh, that we use for heating. Uh, we actually um, uh, can have uh, uh, all these heating devices should also have a uh, system of integral uh, should integrate with a quench quenching system. The, uh, the coolant usually is water or it can be water with some mixtures of maybe polymers or salt or something or it can be even oil if it is a usually if we are employing a hardened steel uh, or sorry uh, an alloy steel then we do not need very uh, drastic quenching. So, instead of water we can use in that case oil. Um, after the process is over that means after the flame hardening is over we actually may need a follow up tempering process, because uh, a material which is through and through hardened 
and having let us say predominantly maybe 90 percent martensite or so, uh, the remaining portion of course, is likely to be retained austenite or in some cases may be perlite. But if you have more than 90 percent martensite, the surface will be extremely hard and also brittle and because of this combination, you cannot machine them and there will be certain amount of distortion which may happen subsequently. So, in order to make the surface amenable to subsequent machining or shaping or some other treatment, we may like to also uh, follow up with the tempering process which is a reheating process. So, essentially we can use the same flame to heat to a temperature way below the eutectoid uh, transition point. So, that means now uh, when we when we talked about um, so, this is temperature and this is carbon content. So, when we are talking about uh, uh, tempering, so for, uh, for flame hardening, we uh, aimed a temperature zone somewhere here for uh, a composition like this, but if we um, want tempering to follow the hardening process, then we would go somewhere around 500 or not even 500, uh, somewhere around uh, let us say 250 to 350 at the most 400 degrees centigrade or so. So, this would be the typical zone. Okay. And uh, what is important is that uh, why are we doing all these uh, exercises? Because we want to harden the surface and by way of bringing in martensitic, martensite. So, we want a predominantly martensitic surface. The, the ultimate aim is to see a hardness level which is typically about 60 in the Rockwell C scale. Now, this is possible no matter how efficiently we do, whether we are able to do it efficiently or not, this is typically possible for the composition range which is 0.4 percent carbon and above. So, this is the carbon content, the, uh, the homogeneous carbon content of the steel. So, if you have a steel which is less than 0.4 percent carbon steel, even if you conduct the process very efficiently you may not be able to reach the requisite hardness. So, the hardness level could be as low as 40 R C. So, this is no good. So, the important guideline here is that we want this range of composition to be subjected to flame hardening and not this range, because a requisite amount of carbon is necessary in the stock uh, during heating process in order to get the desired level of hardness. If you recall during the discourse on martensitic transformation, I did mention that one of the biggest reason of, uh, uh, of seeing martensite as the hardest solid solution phase is because of the fact that uh, uh, martensite actually is um, uh, derives its uh, strength from uh, primarily from supersaturation. So, it is essentially a supersaturated solid solution and uh, the supersaturation if it is less than due to less than 0.3 percent carbon then that is not sufficient for uh, creating the desired uh, hardness uh, after martensite formation. Now, um, there is another method which is equally important and in fact, instead of flame here the uh, thermal activation or so called uh, the, the heating effect is uh, uh, given by uh, electromagnetic induction. So, just like flame what we have here say for example, this is a, a typical um, a shaft or a rod which we want. So, this is the cross section and we want this the surface up to a certain depth to get hardened and the core should remain perlitic or ferritic, but the uh, surface should be martensitic. So, with that intention we simply have a toroidal coil. Uh, electromagnetic induction coil through which this rod can be inserted and we um, apply very high frequency current. So, that uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, fluxes are created and the fluxes intersect the surface and in the process through AD heating they create uh, heating onto the surface. So, the temperature again, uh, so we e exactly see a temperature time profile which will be like this and then will uh, will be subsequently quenched by either dropping into a quenchant or uh, at some other arrangement by throwing um, compressed air and so on. So, we need water cooled copper coil 
for in, uh, magnetic induction, we re need to reach uh, the required transformation temperature and this temperature is reached because of the alternating current that we send to the coil. So, when we send alternating kind current to the coil, we create alternating magnetic field and uh, this magnetic field interacts uh, the fluxes interact with the surface and creates certain thermal state and uh, we that takes the stock to a temperature above the austenite, austenite formation range. So, we can control more precisely here the, uh, the exact depth of heating, the core remains unaffected, but the surface goes to temperature above austenitizing and then subsequently we quench in oil or maybe uh, some other media. So, this is exactly the arrangement that I was talking about and um, uh, we, we actually what we must realize is that this induction hardening follows exactly the Faraday's law and which means that if we apply uh, alternating current reversing at a very high frequency let us say 60 hertz or so, then this is going to lead to very generation of very high eddy current. So, the heating will be through this eddy current. Also in addition there could be uh, alternating cycles of uh, magnetization demagnetization. So, there will be a hysteresis and the area under the loop uh, will also lead to hysteresis heating. We can as I mentioned we can maintain uh, control the depth very precisely and this uh, depth of heating will primarily depend upon the uh, parameters, uh, the heating parameters, the time of heating, the current, the frequency uh, so that we, we reach the correct austenitizing temperature and then subsequently we quench by either spray or by dipping or dropping into a liquid bath. So, this is the uh, this is the depth, this is the circular section. So, um, so this is the coil current and this coil induces uh, current into the stock uh, circular section of which you are seeing here. So, uh, particularly the eddy current that we generate actually is responsible for heating and this is the overall picture of electromagnetic induction. So, these are the fluxes which are created from these induction coils and so the coils are perpendicular to the stock and uh, this is how the flux is generated uh, 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 the left hand thumb rule and then uh, these fluxes intersect the surface and uh, if the material is magnetic then actually we get even uh, better heat uh, or faster heating and that is very true for uh, materials ferromagnetic materials like steel. The, what is important is for us to know that why I was mentioning that the, uh, we can control the depth more precisely. The depth is an inverse function of the square of the square root of the uh, frequency of induction. So, accordingly by applying the frequency we actually can uh, heat up to a temperature above the Curie temperature, but subsequently when it is quenched it undergoes the martin Slick transformation, but uh, the degree to which we heat will primarily depend upon the range of frequency that we apply for inducing current. For electromagnetic induction if the if the frequency is less than 10 kilohertz then uh, this is the relationship that we follow or if the uh, if the uh, frequency applied is higher say for example from few hundred kilohertz to even megahertz then we apply the second relationship. But what is important is the depth from the surface that uh, for example if this is a stock then this is the depth from either side that we are subjecting to. So, this depth can be very precisely controlled uh, by way of controlling this frequency of induction. And typically the depth can be anything from a point less than a millimeter to a few millimeters. So, this is the relationship I was referring to and it is because of this uh, the depth is inversely proportional uh, to the frequency square of the frequency and um, this is what essentially leads to what is typically referred to in the literature as skin effect. So, you actually can harden or heat the surface to above the, uh, above the eutectoid and the austenitizing temperature uh, by way of controlling the frequency. So, the frequency of current reversal uh, is an important factor and the depth will depend upon the resistivity of the material, the magnetic permeability, the frequency of uh, uh, as I said the frequency. So, 
What is also important is that the copper coil which is generally used water cooled copper coil which is generally used for induction the number of turns the distance from the workpiece uh, and of course the power and frequency all these are important process parameters. Time is also very important because uh, the residence time at high temperature determines to what extent from the surface you are able to penetrate the temperature and we already saw that uh, no matter whether it is uh, flame or induction uh, we do generate uh, such isothermal contours from the surface as heating profiles and this changes with time because this is transient heating. So, what is important is that we not only uh, maintain the external parameters like frequency and uh, the current uh, and so on, we also uh, apply such uh, induction effect for a limited time for a control time. So, that the maximum temperature that we reach remains within the solid state and does not go into the liquid state. All right. So, uh, these are various applications, lot many industrial applications for various manufacturing processes, various household uh, appliances, uh, then medical appliances and so on. And this is the microstructure that we uh, target at the surface. So, predominantly martensitic. When I say predominantly, I do not mean 100 percent, but anywhere typically 80 to 90 percent of martensite um, onto the surface and the remaining portion of course, will be the retained austenite. Um, so, this is typically a configuration uh, wherein you are seeing that these are the induction coil and this is the shaft which is being fed into it or if it is a gear teeth, uh, this is. So, you actually will have uh, a configuration which is going to be. So, this is the rotating part and you will have various number of such uh, teeth of the gear like this. And so, if you are targeting one of these uh, teeth like this, then the coil should be uh, properly uh, designed, Ge the geometry of the coil should be so designed that it actually can fit in exactly to this. So, now you are in a position to harden that uh, only the surface of the teeth uh, uh, to the desired depth. This one last thing I wanted to mention is that uh, the heating so far we have done is either by flame or by induction. There is another way of doing this and this has very limited application, but is nevertheless quite effective is when you use an electrolyte. So, you actually are using an aqueous bath electrolytic bath wherein by applying DC pulse not AC and controlling the current and the composition of the electrolyte, you actually can create a hydrogen film onto the surface and because of the resistance created by this hydrogen film, you can do heating onto the surface. So, it is the correct electrolyte that you need to select and during off time, the electrolyte uh, uh, extracts heat from the solid stock and that is how you can actually allow uh, heating and cooling cycle and um, as a result of which you can do hardening. So, you can take it to austenitic state and then subsequently convert this to martensite onto the surface. So, this is uh, the biggest utility of electrolytic surface heating uh, uh, is, is uh, related to the fact that if you have a bath and if you have a stock here inside the electrolytic bath, then you can do heating uniformly or you can harden the entire stock in one shot uniformly, which is not going to be possible when you are using a nozzle for heating or an induction coil for uh, uh, hardening the surface. You cannot do for the entire length together, but here in electrolytic heating you can do that for the entire stock uh, because whole thing is immersed in the electrolyte. So, it is now time to recapitulate what all we have discussed. So, we talked about flame hardening and induction hardening and by now we should be able to understand what is the difference, subtle difference between them. Uh, the underlying uh, technique is heating and cooling uh, in of course, after heating there has to be quenching. Uh, so, that is the common thing. The most important thing is that in both the cases we expect the stock to have sufficient carbon. So, typically over 0 0.3, 0 0.4 percent carbon and uh, then it goes to austenite and subsequently get quenched. So, that we get martensite and hence uh, that is how we uh, create a hardened surface. 
So, it is essentially a solid state hardening process through martensitic transformation and um, uh, we require steel which can be plain carbon steel, but with at least 0.4 percent carbon or maybe alloy steel with sufficient amount of hardenability of it. Um, uh, of course, between the two induction harden is uh, more precise because of the so called skin effect we just heard which is uh, the depth of heating being inversely proportional to the square of the frequency of alternation alteration, alternation of current. And um, uh, last thing we talked about was the electrolytic heating and what is important is that you are able to uh, use or heat and convert the surface up to the limited depth uniformly throughout the surface no matter what the shape and geometry of the solid uh, component is. So, I think that is all for the time being. Thank you very much.